On this episode of Hudson Valley Hustle, I'm joined by Chris Gerardin, Operations Manager of Basement Systems of New York and Foamco, a couple of businesses that you've probably seen driving around at the Hudson Valley. They're a huge family-owned business, and there's definitely some good customer service and home improvement advice in this episode you don't want to miss. There's a couple of things I want to talk about when it comes to basement systems. So yeah. first of all, just give me the rundown of, of what exactly Basement Systems does. Yeah, so Basement Systems, we're a basement waterproofing, structural repair, crawl space repair uh, company. We also do concrete leveling and lifting. So, you know, the tag all things basementy really does encompass everything that we do. Um, something as simple as putting in a sump pump for a customer or changing out an existing sump pump all the way to lifting up your house, knocking down the walls and starting completely over, um, you know, as far as foundation walls go, not, you know sheetrock walls but gotcha. yeah so anything subterranean is our you know business nice now your did your dad start it and was it always basement systems like because that's that's sound it's a franchise right or something there's like a parent company how does that work yeah so the i guess the longer version of the story is uh my father used to be a mason um and that was his business and then one day when you know right after my sister was born he was on a job site prepping getting ready for you know concrete to arrive the next day ran around the side of his truck, got stabbed in the neck with rebar, um, you know, tied a bandana around his neck, finished prepping the job, you know, it was 10 o'clock at night or something like that, got done, came home. And when he hopped in the shower and my mother saw him, she said, you need to, you know, go to the hospital. So he went, ended up getting 40 stitches in his neck and the next day was pouring concrete. So my mother said, you need to find a different career. And just so happened at the same time, my grandfather, so his father-in-law had a wet basement and my father said, I'm, I can fix that. So he fixed his and then the next door neighbor needed one and so on and so forth. And for a little while, um, in the beginning, he was just going around and, you know, getting whatever materials he could from, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's or something like that. And then he thought there has to be a better way. There has to be a better products out here than what the average consumer can get. <clears throat> so he did some research, found basement systems. And at the time there was only three other basement systems, you know, franchises, if you will, um, in the network and he you know called up you know the headquarters of basement systems it was just a guy's home phone number at the time and talked to him and you know learned about the products and said this really is going to be something so he decided to you know become part of the basement system network and you know get access to the products at the time there's only like four or five different things that he yeah. had and now it's expanded to I believe over 60 different products to, you know, waterproof your basements and do structural repairs. So yeah. it's, you know, come a long way over the years as we've grown, you know, basement systems as a, you know, corporation has grown as well. What's the benefit of having a franchise behind you to do this kind of work? So really the big benefit that we have is, you know, access to training. So we don't do on the job, this is my first one and you're learning as you go and a customer who's paying money's home. If we have a project that's happening, we can call them and say, hey, this is something that we have not done before. Go out there, get the proper training, get certified to be able to do it, uh, which is really nice. And also too, um, for our company, they in the beginning, they managed a lot of our web pages and everything like that. You know, now we have, you know, full-time marketing staff to help us as well, but they provide a really good, you know, backbone and, you know, service as far as that goes as well. So did they do a lot of, or do they still do a lot of local marketing or is that more rel relied upon on you guys to get the word out about what you do? Yeah. So they manage, um, our webpage. They built the webpage okay. and do our SEO for us. And then, you know, we have a marketing, you know, team that does all of our local marketing, contacting local vendors, you know, any sort of print advertising or anything like that. The only thing that, you know, corporate does is the web page itself. And then the rest of it is up to us to do. That's good. Do you, do you feel the presence of a franchise when you guys are trying to get stuff done? Cause I know a lot of times you got to run things up the flagpole and, and get approval on things, or do they give you pretty much good autonomy for that kind of stuff? Pretty much we get free reign to do whatever we would like to do. The only thing that they want us to do is use their products in exchange for, you know, them doing the advertising for us. So really it's pretty much a company that advertises for us and then supplies the products for us to do the jobs. Um, there are certain branches that don't, you know, do structural repairs. They only do basement waterproofing. There are okay. certain branches that only do crawl space repair. They don't do anything else. So they give you the ability to do whatever you would like to do within, you know, the network you know, you just use the products that they, you know, provide to do it. Gotcha. Now you guys, you guys also have another 
company or two, right? Like, is it, don't you guys have a couple yeah. of different things that you guys do? It's not just under the Basement Systems brand. Yeah, so we also uh, our foam co, which yep. is you know spray foam installation, and um, you know through that we also do. Um, we had a different company name for a little while there, but we ended up shutting down that name because the foam co name had been so you know prevalent throughout our area for since 2000 we've been spraying foam uh so we decided to kind of funnel everything under one name of foam co so the other you know business that you were referring to you know we don't advertise through yep. them anymore you know the books are still open for that business but we don't advertise through gotcha. them. but um you know pretty much it's a commercial construction you know new builds and then also the other side of foam co we tailor towards homeowners as well and then the third um you know, segment of the business is Tri-State Foundation Waterproofing, where new builds going in, we spray foundation waterproofing coatings on the foundations before the house is, you know, being built, trying to stop any leaks coming through the walls prior to the build, so. Gotcha, yeah. So it's so it's pretty much a family business, right? At this point, yeah. would you say that? Like yeah. It's, uh, you have other family members that work there? Yep, yeah, so my father, he's the owner. Um, my brother, he does all the purchasing of the materials. He also helps a lot with the, um, you know, estimating staff, making sure that when they go out and look at a project if it's detailed he comes back goes over it with him and helps him you know estimate the job correctly and then my mother does you know all the bookkeeping and wears mm -hmm. more hats than probably anybody else so yeah she's you know a huge you know asset to us as well how do you like working with your family um when i was younger it wasn't the most pleasant thing in the world because with my younger brother, it was still older brother, younger brother. It wasn't too business professional. So there was, you know, times on the job site where, you know, we'd be yelling at each other and it was nothing more than just my big brother told me something to do and the little brother didn't want to listen or my little brother told me something to do and I definitely wasn't <laughs> listening to him. So we would bicker and stuff like that. But, you know, as we matured and realized that this is not just a summer job or something we're doing to help dad out. This is the career that we want to have. Um, it was really like an unspoken thing. We just kind of started working together. And um, really the only downside is sometimes your work day is a little bit longer because, you know, you see mom or you see your brother or your father and you go into the office instead of just getting the answers for the questions you have, you start talking about other stuff because people think, oh, it's family business. You see each other all the time. I haven't, you know, seen my brother in probably a week because he's going one direction, I'm going the other, just making everything happen. So I wish we'd get to see each other a little bit more working together. But um, yeah, it's been a really good experience. That's good. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine it could go either way. Yeah. Right. But uh, but no, that's good. I mean, I think it's cool. I think family businesses are awesome. If, especially things that can get passed on yeah. to other generations. I think that's amazing. Is that something that your dad kind of thought of when he? was starting this or did it become that as you guys got older? Yeah. So I think when he first started it, he was just focusing on putting food on the table and, you know, things like that. And, um, I think he was always such a motivated person that I don't know if he would have been able to work for somebody. I think he would always have ambitions that were greater than, you know, um, being an employee somewhere. So he always was, you know, I don't think he actually was working for his father, quit working for his father, and then later on his father started working for him. So he's always been, you know, just crazy, you know, that has to go a million miles an hour. I think later on, once we started growing up and took some interest in the business, that was his, you know, goal to, you know, eventually have it be a family business. But I think in the beginning it was just focused on, you know, let's put food on the table and, you know, grow the business. Yeah. So you guys you guys don't sell something like cheeseburgers, right? You're not selling a five dollar or ten dollar item. You guys are mm -hmm. selling big money jobs. Yeah. Right. How are people dealing with that right now as things are usually kind of strapped for a lot of people when they yeah. have a big problem, like their house is going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. How do they, how are they dealing with that? How are you finding that as you go out and you say, Hey, listen, this is going to cost you $60,000. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So realistically, what it comes down to is your home is gonna be the biggest investment you ever make in your entire life. Um, and it's also what's keeping you safe and protecting you. You spend a lot of time you know, in your house, most people do. So when you go down there, we don't look at it as, oh, this is a $60,000 or $50,000, whatever thousand dollar project. We look at it as this is the necessary work in order to establish, you know, the home back to structural stability or stop water intrusion or, you know, fix the crawl space or whatever. Um, when we present, you know, the total project to the customer, sometimes there is a price tag, you know, 
very you know expensive associated with it and we have financing options and things like that for the customers um you know and what it comes down to at the end of the day is a lot of people look at the project and they say well this is going to be very expensive but oftentimes they see that it's going to be worth it and save the home and retain value on it because if you have a basement that has water in it or you have a structural issue your house is a depreciating asset rather than an appreciating as asset we've seen in the past couple of years that home values have just skyrocketed everyone who had you know structural issues or a wet basement or you know messed up crawl space their house didn't appreciate the same way yeah it was more worth yeah. more money sure. but it didn't continue to grow so people see that they're investing into the home and hopefully you know the rates of the home continue to increase and you know they get their money back you know in the end yeah because when it comes to these issues only three things can happen with your home you can either you know pass it on to a loved one one day you can sell it or it can be foreclosed upon those are the only three things that happen when you buy a house so not taking care of it probably is not the right thing to do because you're either going to leave the problem to your family or when you go to sell it it's not going to be worth the same amount of money because you didn't take care of it over the years gotcha so are you selling a lot of the jobs do you sell some of the jobs yeah i go out and i do a couple appointments a week just to make sure you know see where the market is and this way i'm in touch with the staff that's out there doing the estimates and also too um i need to be able to see projects from start to finish in order mm -hmm. to be able to make sure I can tell other people what to do. Yeah. How do you, uh, you have any tips for somebody that sells a high ticket? Yeah. Um, honestly, the biggest tip that I would give is to know the project inside out forwards and backwards. People are so educated these days that when they're going out there looking at projects, if you're not positive on anything, the customer will be able to pick that up if you're just being a yes man or whatever the case is. You want to make sure that you really understand what you're doing and the product and the way you explain it matches the value to the customers. When I go through and I'm looking at a basement waterproofing project, I will walk them through like I'm going to be jackhammering this section of the basement. I'm going to be physically picking up the concrete, throwing it on my shoulder and walking all the way to the truck where the truck is going to be parked. And then when you build the whole picture, they can see, wow, there's a lot of value in this project. I understand where this is coming from. Just walking in there and just saying, yep, you got a wet basement. This is what I'm going to do to fix it. And this is how much it costs. It's not building any sort of value. If you can walk the customer through because you truly know what needs to happen, it you know dramatically helps with the project. Yeah, of course. I, if if you're kind of a like a consultant slash salesperson mm -hmm. and you're educating your customer yeah. on things, like same you know same in my business, I have to teach you how things work. Yep. In order for you to understand and be confident in buying the thing that you're going to be spending thousands of dollars on, right? Exactly. Otherwise, you're just going to be selling snake oil at that point. Yeah. They don't know. They don't know the difference. So it's it's more about a teach first kind of philosophy, mm -hmm. sell after, yeah. right? And really get an idea of what they need, what they want, and yeah. then provide them with the thing that they need or that they want. Yeah. It's, and also too, most, you know, most of the customers that we deal with, they've had somebody work on their home at some point. Most of the time, you know, we always encourage going from the basement up. You want to work from the ground up. But let's just take your average homeowner these days, buying a home, moving to, into the area, or, you know, just changing from renting to buying a house, they move in, they want to change the floors, the kitchen cabinets, the bathroom. They want to do all those things. The pretty stuff. The pretty stuff yeah. that they can show off to their friends and family. Taking care of the basement is usually the last thing on the list. It's something that they you know, don't necessarily want to do, but they have to do. So by the time we go out there to you know, work with the customer, they've already had a couple contractors that they either really like or they don't want anything to do with anymore. And if they really like the, the other contractors, they you know will call a lot of people in before they find a basement waterproofing expert or a structural expert to go out there yeah. and give them the right evaluation. So a lot of times they've already been told things and then you have to re-educate and go over, well, I understand that was the thought process this isn't correct because of X, Y, and Z. And you got to kind of tread really lightly in those mm -hmm. situations because this is somebody that they've trusted. Yeah, They're not giving the correct information and that might be whatever contractor they're speaking to. It might be their depth of knowledge on the project. They yeah. just don't simply know as much because it's not their field of expertise. But a lot of companies I find in our area try to dabble in a little bit of everything rather than just focusing on one thing. They're just like, oh, I got this job. Oh, I got this job. Well, that's great, but it's not exactly what you're the expert in. I mean, a pretty decent example of that is 
I had a customer I went out to four years ago and they needed a sliding glass door cut into their foundation because they were doing a big landscaping project. Someone else was taking care of the regrading and all the other stuff, but that contractor was like, I'm a specialized contractor. I don't do concrete cutting. I don't, you know, do these sliding glass doors. So hire somebody. They called me out there. I looked at it and they had a bunch of other stuff that they wanted to do, moving windows, et cetera. And it was a walkout. So it was a four foot frost wall. And then there was wood framing on top of it. So there was siding that went down to meet the concrete. I told them, look, I can do the cutting, I can move the windows, but someone has to take the siding off first and then put the siding back when we're done. You know, we don't do all of that, we're not an expert in it. Um, I went back out there actually yesterday because they didn't put the proper headers over top of the windows and doors and they wouldn't open and close because the weight of the house had, you know, made the wood bend and now they can't use their windows and doors. And then I went outside and I found out that it was the same contractor said he could do everything didn't put drip edges on any of the windows or anything like that. And now they have to rip out all of the work that was previously done and have it have the structural stuff done by us right. and then hire a siding contractor to come in and fix it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, although I knew what needed to be done, it's not my area of expertise and I'm not going to try to dabble in it because I'm going to do perfect work with what I know. And I want to make sure that the whole experience is good. So I'll refer a contractor to do something else before I just say, you know what, I can do that too, or I can do that. Yeah, I think that puts such a bad taste in people's mouths, man. Yeah. I, I mean this by no 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 offense to you guys, because I haven't worked with you or anything like that on, on that regard, but I am not a fan of home improvement contractors. Yeah. I'm not. I have gotten burned both in business side, personal side. Yeah. So many of them suck. And mm -hmm. it's once you get a customer that's been burned by that, it's really hard to to gain their trust back. Yeah. And, or to trust somebody in the industry, yeah. right? So it's like how do you guys, how do you manage that? I know you said like knowing the ins and outs of the project, but there's a lot of shitty contractors out there. Let's, yeah. let's call it what it is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the hard part is, you know, sometimes on the bigger projects is overcoming past, you know, um, trauma, if you want to call it that sure. from dealing with other contractors right now, I'm in the middle of building my house and, you know, I'm doing a lot of it myself, but I'm also relying on some contractors and it's not easy dealing with these, you know, contractors as far as even just getting a phone call back, it's like, hey, I would like to spend money with you. I'd like to use your company. And they can't return a phone call, get a quote back to you. It's, you know, really ridiculous. Um, but I've, you know, definitely heard so many horror stories from contractors that just stuff goes wrong. And I think that's one thing um, that I didn't understand when I was growing up that there's contractors out there who don't do what they say and don't deliver on their promises because growing up, there was no other option. It was like, you do what you say you're going to do and you mean what you say and you deliver the exact, you know, project to the customer. If something goes wrong, make sure it gets fixed and, you know, leave every customer as happy as possible. Obviously we've waterproofed over 15,000 basements uh, since we've been in business or structure repair crawl space, but we've done work on over 15,000 people's homes and we have, you know, amazing reviews and, you know, make sure we have a lot of happy customers as well. Over 15,000, there's maybe one or two that aren't the most happy people, but I don't think anything could please those. So we try yeah, our best. Yeah, you can't, I mean, you, you can't make everybody happy, yeah. right? But if you can make 14,998 people happy, that's, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty good. good track record, yeah. right? Like it's pretty decent. Um, how, how important is it for you guys, or let me ask you this, do you guys aggressively go after customer reviews? Um, so a couple years ago, we worked with a company that kind of did like big email blasts. We sent them our whole contact list and they went out and that really kind of up the reviews. Um, but now what we like to do is put a more personal touch on it. Now that we have a good base uh, settled where um, our marketing team will reach out to the customers individually when the project's done, um, as well as whoever the representative was that, you know, quoted the project and everything like that. Both of them will reach out usually when the project's done, make sure that everything was exactly how, you know, it was talked about. And then if something's not perfect, set up a time to go out there remedy it, which, you know, very seldom happens, but we like to be on top of it. And then if everything did go, you know, as smooth as anticipated, then, mm -hmm. you know, we usually ask for review at that time. And if the customer wants to give it great, and if not, you know, not a huge deal, we'll have another, you know, customer who will give us a review. Yeah, exactly. I, I, dude, I can't tell you how many times I tell every, every business. I'm like, when you, after you sell something to a happy customer, mm -hmm. just ask for it. Yeah. Like just ask, right? Yeah. I mean, you guys have a team, you have a system now in place. It sounds like yep. to actually handle that. Yeah. But 
from the smallest to the largest. I think even when you're small, it's easier to yeah. ask for the review. Yeah. Like, just do it. It's it's going to help you. Yeah. Right? And, and even if it's not a great review, it's going to help you because yeah. you're going to learn the things you did wrong mm -hmm. and what to fix Yeah, to make that customer happy and to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah. That's the thing. You, you know, trial and error is a, is a, you know, the way you learn, you can do things the same way for a hundred customers and one out of the hundred customers doesn't like how you did something and they bring it up and you change it. And then a different customer comments is, Oh, I really like how you did that. It's like, well, although you had 99 other people happy, even that one piece of feedback is still important because, you know, we're trying to please everybody. Like we said, it's not possible, but if you take little bits of feedback from every direction you possibly can and accept it and try to change what you're doing to benefit people, then, you know, it, you're in a good situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it just, I feel like the easiest way to make money, especially in like a post pandemic world is just do a decent job. And it sounds like super simple, but there are so many industries, businesses, um, service, retail, whatever it is that have suffered, mm -hmm. not because of what happened, but because of just a lack of caring in just doing the thing well. Yeah. Just answering the phone, being there when you say you're going to be there, yeah. uh, being nice to somebody, asking questions, yeah. just being accountable. Like it, yeah. it's, it's stuff that should be just simple. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, especially in the home improvement world, yeah. if you can just do those basic things, you'll probably crush it. Yeah. It's, there's no secret formula. It's just do what you say you're going to do. Answer the phone. When somebody calls. I mean, th those are the two biggest things. Um, but <laughs> but now, it, isn't that, it sounds so dumb. Yeah. But like, if all you had, if all you did was just answer the phone mm -hmm. and do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd kill it. Yeah. And it's what I really kind of think happens is businesses get to a point where in the beginning, the owner can, you know, answer the phones and do what he says he's going to do. And they start out that way. And then it starts to grow in demand. And oftentimes that person is a really good, you know, technician and they're really good at their job, but they're not very good at running a business. So then they can't delegate responsibilities. So now it's just one person doing the install, trying to call the people and doing all that stuff. And it just becomes too much for one person to handle. But they don't trust anybody else. So they try to keep it all here. And then although they're still phenomenal at what their job is, they're not good at doing all the other aspects of the business. And I feel like that's kind of the biggest downfall. It's in the beginning, everything's perfect. And then it starts to fall apart when things get to a certain level of growth that's just unmanageable. The business will either grow at that point or it will stay the same size forever. There's not really, you know, another option or it will grow and you'll have a bunch of unhappy customers and then it will fold. You know, there's not a, not really an in-between. Did you read the E-Myth? Did you read that book? No, I haven't. You literally said it exactly the way that that book, they, he calls people that do a good job, a technician and transitioning <laughs> into business. Yeah, it's, it's a good book that's for funny. anybody, yeah. And that's like my father, he put a lot of emphasis on me and my brother learning the trade in the field. Like I started, washing trucks and sweeping floors when I was, you know, 11 or 12 years old. And I slowly started, you know, working with the guys in the summertime and everything like that. Once I got, you know, working papers and everything like that. And then I had um, a conversation with my father, like, I really love in the mornings how you've got 50 guys running over to you and you have the answer, make sure you bring a ladder. You need this, you need that. Oh, make sure you have that with you. You know, you're going to need to take this truck because the driveway's tight. Just having all the answers for all the projects that were going on, I would just stand there. Well, I wouldn't stand. I would listen when I could, because if I stood, I'd probably have gotten, you know, um, <laughs> a talking to, but I would just be in amazement of how he'd have all the information and didn't miss a beat with anything. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be that guy who has the answers for all the things and, you know, dispatches everybody where they're going. So I, you know, had a conversation with him. He said, well, if that's what you'd like to do, then you need to know how to do this inside and out the same way that your foreman and all the other crew members, you know, know how to do it. Because yeah. if you can't do it yourself, then you can't trust somebody else to do it because, you know, as a business grows, you need to be able to hire people. And if they don't trust that you can do it or know that you can do it well, then they'll take advantage of you. The jobs will start to take longer. So that was a really big thing that he made, you know, 
had me and my brother do was go learn it and be able to run a job site ourselves. And once we were able to do that, then he started giving us more responsibility because he knew that, all right, you have the important stuff, the in the field technician stuff down. The other stuff, you know, can be taught to you. The other yeah. stuff you have to be willing to learn. And sometimes you just have it or you don't. You know, some people are, you know, good masons, some are bad, some are good waterproofers, some are bad. It really just depends on, you know, your desire to want to do it. Yeah, of course. You guys have seen some pretty solid growth, right, in the last yeah. How many years? Yeah, I'd say when I graduated college, you know, we had a full team, you know, together between me, my father, and my brother, um, and my mom as well. Um, because before, you know, I had graduated, my father was doing a lot of things by himself, um, you know, and managing that much, um, you know, without, um, you know, a whole bunch of support was a lot for him. So it was, he was in the situation where he was maxed out with what his workload is, um, but the company was ready to keep going. So all it really took was for, you know, him to have me and my brother get out there and be able to help him with what his vision was and what his goals were and, you know, grow the company that way. So it's um, been really, um, you know, good the past couple of years, but we've now have three people, you know, working towards a common sure. goal. And then my mother also working towards that goal, but doing everything behind the scenes that people don't necessarily see to make sure that what we're doing is, you know, able to be done. So it's, you know, really good, you know, teamwork. How big is the team? Total, um, like, give me like, a I think we have right around 50 employees, that's 50 great. to 55 right now. Yes, you guys employ 50 or 50 or 60. That's, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Good for you guys. Um, do you have uh, anything else that you want people to know about when it comes to basement systems or foam co or anything like that or how they can reach you guys? Yeah. So um, you can find us online um, at, you know, what's the web page, Marco? <clears throat> basement systems of NY. Basement systems of NY. Um, also foamcoinc.com. Um, you can call us. Um, our basement systems number is uh, 845-361-1159. And the foam number is 845-361-1110. So you can reach us, you know, there. Reach out to us on social media as well. Um, you know, we're constantly checking that. And, um, you know, I guess a couple other things I'd like people to, you know, know is it might be a cliche saying, but if you don't have the money to do it right the first time, you probably don't have it in your budget to do it twice. Um, I go to a lot of customers' homes, and we definitely aren't the lowest price contractor for any of the work that we do, but we are the best and the most professional. And um, it's better to wait and not do anything, save up the funds, and then do the project rather than do it one time, then have to wait because the problem's not fixed, and then have us yeah, redo, redo it. it. Um, you know, it not going to be cheaper the second time around it only gets more expensive as time goes on um and even though somebody did some work most of it isn't good if it's not working so we can't use what somebody else had done um you know there's been multiple times over the past couple of years where more people are trying to you know get into i don't even want to say get into the industry but somebody's cousin knows somebody and that person said they can fix it type yeah. deal and that price is, you know, substantially less than whatever yours is. And then the project comes out and it's not the same. Sure. Another thing that we do that's different than most contractors is we don't give estimates for the jobs. It's not, I think this is what it's going to cost. And when the project's done, we'll square up. It's, this is exactly what your project is going to cost. If I run into an issue, it is my fault because I made a mistake. It is not yours as a homeowner. So whatever that number is, is exactly what it's going to be with the exception of our poly level which is slab injection mm -hmm. and raising we can't have you can't see through the concrete to see how big the void is so we do our best to get an estimate and we have a poundage clause in there that the customer is aware of and before we exceed the amount of pounds that was allotted for the job we talk to the customer and say hey look this is where your project currently is with what was you know allotted for your project would you like us to continue so they have the yeah. choice um you know, and very often it's not very far off. And then, um, you know, with our foundation peering systems that we do, uh, we have a depth clause, which 30 feet is included in every one of those projects. Mm -hmm. Anything past 30 feet is an additional charge, but we have ways to go out there and test to get what our approximated depth is going to be so we can change it and get it really, you know, close to accurate. Gotcha. So. Yeah, it's rare to it's rare in the home improvement business to get 
not an estimate, but a cost. Yeah. I yeah. feel like, I feel like contractors are afraid to do that. Yeah. And I like to tell people, if you have somebody out to your home and they say, Oh, I need to go back and look at this. I need to call and ask about this. That's because they don't do it every single day. When you have a professional in your home, they should be able to give you a proposal before they left. Unless your job for some reason is extremely complicated and the contractor has talked to you about, hey, this is going to be more difficult than usual because of X, Y, and Z. I'm going to go back, you know, figure this out because it's not just a straightforward project. But for 95% of the things that you look at, the contractor should be able to produce a firm non-changing price before they leave. And if they can't do it, they don't do it often enough to, you know, be able to, I wouldn't trust them is what I would say. If, if you can't get that number off um, pretty much immediately, I've had customers that I went out there, gave them a proposal right there, you know, on the spot. It's not like, Hey, you need to purchase this now, but for me, I'm doing so many things. I'm going to get you your proposal now because you probably waited a week or two for me to come out and see you. It's going to be really disrespectful if I take another two weeks to get back to you. You took time off of work. You took time out of your day to meet with me. The least I can do is get you the information that you took your time off of your busy day to get. Sure. So I'm going to provide that for you pretty much instantaneously. And then if it's something that you want to do, great. We'll just call the office and get it scheduled. But if not, do whatever research you want to do. Talk to whoever you want to talk to. You know, a lot of times these are family decisions because it's not, sure. you know, a small couple hundred dollar project. Um, and then call us whenever. And I'll call people back two weeks later and be like, hey, just wondering where you're at with the project. You'd be like, oh, I'm just waiting on so-and-so to get me a proposal. Hey, just out of curiosity, did they come out to look at this before me or after me? Oh, they were there a couple weeks ahead of you. And you still haven't gotten a proposal. Well, maybe that's not someone you want to do work yeah, with. Yeah, sure. But, you know, it should most things should be pretty much instantaneous, you know. Costs have relatively leveled out since COVID across the entire construction industry. Yeah. There's still some, you know, spikes here and there, but, um, you know, that should be a conversation with the customer. Hey, yep. our costs sure. are pretty much standard. If we get a huge increase before you, you know, accept the bid, we'll have a conversation about yep. it. So Right on. So cool, man. Do good work. Do right by your customers. Show up when you say you're going to and answer the phone. That's Yeah, that's the keys. That's I mean, <laughs> I think we um, we should make a book and just write those that's four the steps book. Yeah, exactly. sell it man. on Amazon. Ab seriously, absolutely, man. Well, listen, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, Good thanks luck for to everything. Us. And uh, we'll see you soon, I'm sure. Also, do I got time to say one more thing? Go ahead. Yeah. Also, I'm, you've worked with us a couple times yeah. shooting video and making content for us. And I just want to say all the work that you've done has, you know, Everyone who sees it in our office or anyone outside of the office when we're showing people on jobs and stuff like that, they think it's phenomenal. And awesome. you've been really, you know, awesome work with as well. You do those four things. So <laughs> it's 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 pretty amazing. You find other people who do those four things and you can really, you know, um, benefit each other and, you know, help each other's businesses cool, grow. Man. So I appreciate we really that. appreciate it. Thanks, man. Awesome. It's good seeing you. Good seeing you as well.